I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum. Hello, hello. Hello. Those of you watching on Patreon may notice our our outfits for today. We've decided to go some flower child vibes and uh, yeah. I don't have a lot of colorful clothes in my wardrobe. I will say it's a lot of black, white, gray, army green, and burgundy. Those are my, that's my color palette. Those are staples. So when Dina messaged me earlier and was like, wear something flowery, I was like, uh, I'm sure I can dig something up. So this lovely get up that I have no idea where it came from. I love it. And honestly, I gave her like no notice. Like I did this like maybe like two hours ago and uh, I feel like we're, we're rocking it. I don't know. It's inspired. I like yeah. it. Mine's got... maybe a little more 70s than 60s flower childs, but whatever. I mean, we're late 60s in this episode, so you're fine. It's fine. This, this dress I got from 97th Street Vintage here in Edmonton, yeah. and it is dated 1964-65. Oh, so we got a real vintage end. Yeah, I love it. But honestly, like, it is uh, not not the comfiest, but it is it is pretty darn cute. So I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm going to change the sweatpants the second we're done. But Same. As right. soon as I get home, it's like bra off, leggings on, no fucks given. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, so I am personally really excited for part two here, so uh, let's get her rocking and rolling. Yeah, so as you guys know, last week's episode was a bit of a doozy, and we did warn you that more shitty stuff was coming. He's got probably one of the roughest childhoods that we've ever covered. Yeah, and a lot of serial killers do. We've talked about that many, many times, but Charles Manson is definitely up there. And yeah, I mean, like I say, considering what we've talked about in the past kind of tells you how this story is going to go. Last week, we learned that Charles Manson spent the majority of his young life in and out of institutions, and he met his first wife, Rosalie Willis, but the marriage didn't last long. She left him for another man once Charles ended up back in prison after a short stint of what he called the street life. Like we mentioned, they divorced, and she took their young son with her. And we want to take a second to talk about Charles Manson Jr. It's probably not going to surprise you all to know that this is also a truly sad story. Charles Jr. was born in 1956. We don't know a lot about him other than the fact that the shadow of who his father was followed him throughout his entire life. I mean, how could it not? That's a bad daddy. I wouldn't be going around telling people who my dad was. No. Shortly after the divorce, Rosalie married a man named Jack White. Together, the two would have two more children named Jed and Jesse. And I even like toyed with putting this in the script, but I cannot hear Jack White without thinking of the White Stripes. That's exactly what I thought too. And I feel like Jack White is kind of like John Smith. It is. Yeah, it's just totally. a very common white dude name. It looks like he had a good relationship with his stepdad because he would later change his name to Jay White. However, death and dysfunction would continue to follow Rosalie. This really is tragic. According to an old issue of the Times Reporter, Jed was playing with a friend of his. The two somehow got their hands on a shotgun and Jed was fatally shot in the stomach by his playmate. Oh God, that's brutal. He was 11. Oh God, you guys lock up your firearms around kids. Yeah. Oh. This obviously devastated the family. That's such a horrible way to lose a child. As for Jesse, according to a death certificate, he died on August 23rd, 1986 from a heroin overdose. He had been out drinking with a friend of his. That friend would later find Jesse's body in his vehicle. Poor Rosalie. Like, oh, it's so sad. The deaths around her continued. Seven years later, the body of Jay White was discovered. The cause of death was determined to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. It's said that he spent his entire life haunted by his father, being one of the most notorious men in history. Before his death, Jay fathered a son named Jason Freeman. Jason has referred to the Manson name as a family curse and remembers being in junior high and hearing his teacher talk about Charles Manson while all of the other children looked at him. Picture that scene. Like, you've got this kid, he's in the middle of a classroom, they're talking about Charles Manson, because who hasn't heard of Charles Manson? Oh, I mean, as shitty as it is to say, he's a household name. He really is. And I mean, you're sitting there, you're, I mean, it's hard enough being in, like, junior high and stuff, and then all of a sudden they're talking about the fact that your dad is, like, the definition of evil. Well, even for an example 
I'm from a very small town named Merthorpe. If you're from small town Alberta, you might recognize it because back in, I believe, 2003, a charming gentleman by the name of Jim Roscoe uh, shot and murdered four RCMP officers and then killed himself. And the Roscoe name, it's it's a pretty big family in mm-hmm. Merthorpe. And if you had any link to that last name, or for example, like I knew a kid in... Um, one of my classes in high school whose mom had like dated his brother, oh which God. has nothing to do with the man himself, but you bet your ass kids like brought it up every time they had the chance to. So kids are mean. They're going to pick on you. Cause like your hair sits differently. They're going to definitely pick on you. If your dad killed people. Oh, 100%. He was bullied relentlessly due to his lineage. Rosalie even forbade him from ever talking about his grandfather Jason grew up to be a cage fighter who now spends his time trying to show people you can move on despite your upbringing. When speaking about his father in an interview, Jason said, He just couldn't let it go. He just couldn't live it down. He couldn't live down who his father was. And I mean, that would certainly be a hard pill to swallow because first of all, that name is quite well known. Second, like I said, it's hard to find anyone who's never heard of Charles Manson. Even if you know very little about him, you know he wasn't exactly a good guy. Imagine how difficult it would be to have to deal with a shocked reaction every time you told someone your dad was Charles Manson. And wildly enough, Jason actually tried to connect with the grandfather, whose dark history was arguably responsible for the death of his dad, The two would eventually become somewhat close and would even tell each other that they loved one another. That surprised me. I, I'm sure there's always a sense of curiosity deep down to know who you, who your family is, no matter, even if they were an evil piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it would be in me personally to reach out. I think I'd be like, no, thank you. That is a door that is closed. We are never opening it. Padlock, padlock, padlock. Yeah, I can definitely see the curiosity, though, because, I mean, knowing who he was probably helped Jason understand himself a little bit better, too. That's true. Absolutely. We don't want to skip too far forward here, but it is very interesting to note that after the death of Charles Manson, Jason became involved in a lengthy legal battle for the rights to Charles's body and possession of all of his items. He planned to sell the memorabilia and donate the money to charity. He would eventually win this, but we will get to all of that much, much later. Anyways, let's take a step back in the way, way back machine (laughs) to where we last left off with Charles Manson. In jail with hopes and dreams of becoming a successful pimp. After all, it was the best gig on the planet. And in typical Charles Manson fashion, he really has a way with words when describing how he came to this conclusion. In Manson, in his own words, he says, The stories I heard about big cars, pretty girls, luxurious apartments, fine clothes, and plenty of money had me thoroughly convinced. There wasn't anything better in life than having control over several women and letting them provide for your every need. Ick. Oh, there's going to be... This episode is going to make y'all mad. (laughs) Like, this is not... uh, I'd say it definitely... I I don't think I'm easily offended, but this, this gets pretty offensive real quick. Fair enough. So he befriended an inmate known as Vic. Once the two had developed a decent enough rapport, he asked him exactly how he could go about this, to which Vic replied, Charlie, it's been over 20 years since I've had to work on a girl for her to hustle for me. All the girls that come my way are already hustlers. But Charlie, there really isn't anything to it. Almost every broad alive at one time or another in her life has had the desire to be a whore. Pause. Yeah, can't say I have. Can't, no, no. Again, we've talked about this. Sex work, when done correctly and everyone is protected and doing things safely. And willing. And willing. Yeah. Well, who cares? Yeah. If you think that a sex worker sells their body, but like, say, a soldier or a minor or a laborer doesn't. Yes, thank you. Have a little word with yourself. Maybe put some things into perspective. But anyway, there's a difference, I will say, between that and just straight up exploitation. And that's oh, this absolutely. Is. This is horrendous. So please go on, Charlotte. <laughs> a lot of girls are rock- <laughs> rocked up. A lot of girls are wrapped up in moral ethics and would never turn out. 
but any woman would be lying to you if she were to deny that she didn't wonder what's a whore's life is like. For those who are reluctant, a good pimp knows how to eliminate the barriers and convince the girl that his love will be deeper than ever for her if she is willing to go all the way for him. Has he been talking to Andrew Tate or vice versa? Right? Oh my god. Like, Charlotte, can you imagine if one day Cody was like, have you seen the price of eggs nowadays? Time to go sell your body. I can't say I've gotten to a point where I have considered this, and I am quite insulted, to be honest, and offended, if you will, that this man is like, oh yeah, that's all women dream of. They've all thought about it. Make no mistake. It's like, buddy... Come on. And it's going to get so much worse, you guys. Like, <laughs> seriously, we had someone complain recently that uh, apparently we swear too much. But uh, if you don't like that, you're not going to like this episode <laughs> at all. Uh, shockingly enough, Charles Manson was actually able to make all of this work. By 1958, Charles was 23 years old. That's another thing. If a 23-year-old right? man came up to me and was like, hey, honey, you want to make some money? I would be like, you are a fetus, go back to school. A 23-year-old Charles Manson at that. I would laugh in his face. Yeah. His time at Terminal Island had come to an end, and the release took him all the way to Hollywood, California, and we really want him to use his own words to describe his first impression of the new stomping grounds. What can I say about Hollywood that hasn't already been said? I saw it as the most artificial, most pretentious city in existence. I suppose that line of thinking can be attributed to the movie and TV industry since everyone in it is looking for recognition and stardom. To me, it seemed as if everyone I came in contact with was greedy, narcissistic, and lacking in morals. I was in my element. Again, I don't disagree with him. I kind of think all of those things about Hollywood. Yeah, pretty much every time I see a new news story, so... So in Charles's mind, his time at Terminal Island was like going to university, but for being a criminal. However, like so many times before, things didn't work out the way he wanted. For starters, women weren't lining up to quote unquote work for him. Of course they freaking were. <laughs> Seriously, he had it in his head that he'd show up in Hollywood and every woman that he would encounter would be dying to sell her body for him. I don't mean to shame his height by any means but sweetie you're a five foot five what 130 pounds soaking wet yeah felon and he did say he was thinner when he was incarcerated so he's closer to like a 115 right now so buddy no one is lining up for you oh <laughs> The women engaging in the local sex work didn't want some 23-year-old nobody by their side. The men that they currently worked for were well-established and at least could somewhat take care of them. Eventually, he met a lady named Leona Stevens, also known as Candy, and the two ended up in a relationship. When the time came to bring up the conversation of her doing what he wanted, he realized he was in love, and the idea of her sleeping with someone else killed him inside. In his words... Some pimp I was. When I read that in the book, I heard it in an ER voice. <laughs> Some pimp I was. <laughs> Eventually, the other pimps around town started giving him a hard time for being with a woman and not making her sell her body. We got a bunch of real winners in the story, I don't mean, we? Guys, men, <laughs> do better. One night, as he tells it, he was sitting in the living room with Candy when he told her the two needed to have a talk. And this is how it went. So was this exactly how it happened? Probably not. Again, this is Charles's version of the story, but we're going to act this out for you. So do you want to be Candy or Charles? I'm going to be Charles. Okay, then I will be Candy. All right. <clears throat> We've been together for weeks. You know I'm out here stealing and breaking my ass to keep us in this apartment and some food in our mouths. Here we are, living in an area that's loaded with all the finer things in life. Those things are passing us by. We both dig making the scene down on sunset. You like nice things, and I enjoy seeing you with nice things. Why, do, why don't the two of us really put our heads together and make us a good life in this town? It's a player's town, and players only stay in an area where there's a lot of money and action. You are one of the prettiest girls I have ever seen, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. Every time you walk down the street, guys start undressing you with their eyes. Now, why don't we start taking advantage of all those rich, hungry bastards? 
You know I love you and want the best for you. Question is, how much do you love me? And how far are you willing to go for both of us to get on top? To which she replies, Charlie, I'll do anything in the world for you. You mean it? Certainly I mean it. Tell me your plans and you can count on me. Would you fuck for me? Would you? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> Would you fuck for me? Will you turn tricks and hustle your ass for me? If that's what you want me to do, Charlie. Now, whether it actually went this way or not, I'm thinking not. I'm thinking not, too. The conversation ended with Candy agreeing to, in Charles's words, hustle her ass. According to Charles, her first night out was incredibly difficult for him. Aw, wah, wah. He sat in the car while she was at some dude's house debating on whether or not he was okay with it or if he wanted to break into the guy's house and beat him up and apologize to her. He states that when she returned to the car, he expected her to be sad, but instead she told him that the guy wanted to see her again next week and that she was excited for it. They're upset too. Yeah, if you can hear the chirping, the birds are also not happy with this pimping no, thing. No, they're not. On. They're like, he's a liar, he's a liar. Don't fall for it, Candy. He says that later that night when they were having sex, he felt sad and insecure. He spent the entire time wondering if the other guy had been better than him. From there, he went on to find a few more ladies who were willing to work for him. His ideal woman was not too pretty and not too smart. It gets so much worse. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm a pig of a man. It's like, I know you can hear me. <laughs> it's... It's crazy reading Manson in his own words and Helter Skelter at the same time because it is seriously like whiplash. Two completely different stories. Isn't that funny? Isn't it? Isn't it? Because it's like, like two extremes though. I think that just goes to prove that one, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, and two, serial killing cult leading assholes lie. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say that there is clearly a lot in this book that's difficult to read, but like, damn, this honestly, it made me roll my eyes. I probably had the bitchiest look on my face the entire time I'm reading this. Just like, yeah, I, are, are you fucking for real, Charles Manson? For the most part, his ladies wouldn't stick around for too long. They'd often fall in love with a client and just leave the business, or sometimes they'd move on to another pimp who had more experience and was, in Charles's own words, Classier. I don't think it's hard to be classier than Charles Manson. No, the bar is pretty low there. And it's interesting, too, to see him look up at other pimps. Do literally? We, do it literally. <laughs> Men's is 5'5", five, five, soaking wet. Um, and be like, oh, yes, there were classier pimps out there than me. I picture him in, like, a ratty little suit, like, twirling a cane on the street while, like, everyone's just like, who the fuck are you? In my mind... I don't know if anybody out there is a fan of the Boondocks. Mm -hmm. A pimp named Slickback. <laughs> like Cat yes. Williams' character. Yes. With like the purple convertible Cadillac. Yep. With the pimp suit and the big hat and the like big gaudy rings and the cane. I'm imagining that's who Charles is looking up to. And you know, if you've watched the Boondocks, a pimp named Slickback would look down on him and be like, Sir, get out of my way. Yup, absolutely. <laughs> In 1959, Charles was sentenced to 10 years for cashing a whopping $37.50 from a stolen check. He did end up getting a shorter probationary sentence. The judge took one look at his rap sheet and immediately wanted to keep him inside for as long as possible. He was warned that if he broke the law again, he would spend 10 years in jail. Going from a 10-year sentence to probation is a pretty significant decrease in a sentence, especially considering the judge didn't originally agree with it, so you may be wondering how that got pulled off. At the age of 19, Candies called the law office and tearfully told them that she was pregnant and that Charles was the father. She begged them to lower the sentence. Now, I want to clarify something because this confused the hell. I spent hours on this. Mm -hmm. Confused as hell. In Manson, in his own words, he calls her Sandy. Oh. I don't know why. I, I don't, there's no mention of Sandy anywhere else. And so at first I was thinking there's a Sandy and then there's a Candy. There's a Sandra Good. 
who is one of the Manson girls, right. but he's not going to meet her for another few years. Weird. And also, can I just say, I know it's common when you're doing that kind of work to have your street name, mm-hmm. if you will, to protect yourself. But Leona is such a pretty name. It is a pretty name. I really like that. And for him to be, well, she may have come up with Candy herself. I don't yes. wanna, I don't want to remove that from her. But to go from Leona to Candy, it's like, no, girl. You are Leona. Please be Leona. (laughs) So, okay, as far as I can see, Sandy and Candy are the same person. He writes the same story about Sandy that everyone else has written about Candy, and it really gets muddled when it comes to her story. So after hours of trying to figure this out, I'm pretty confident in saying that Sandy is Candy. If I'm wrong, someone please correct me and show me where this information is. Yes, please. it's, It's very likely, first of all, that she did lie about being pregnant, by the way. Um, But this was kind of her ploy to get him out. Okay, gotcha. So a medical report was ordered as well as a background check. Meanwhile, Charles's attorney made a deal and he was examined by a psychiatrist who strongly urged against releasing him. Not only that, the entire probation department also disagreed that this was the right thing to do. Despite that, Candy somehow persuaded them that it Despite that, Candy somehow persuaded them that releasing him was exactly the right move. So you'd think that this would frighten him into behaving for at least a little while. But if you honestly do believe that, you don't know old Charlie. By this point, committing crimes was second nature to him. In his eyes, it was who he was and more importantly, who he was raised to be. From here on out, he began taking women to different conventions around the country. He saw that these were filled with a lot of lonely men away from home who wanted to spend time with someone, and he took full advantage of that. He got into some trouble for taking a bunch of women across state lines when he himself was not supposed to be leaving the state. The police were looking for him, so he decided to run off to Mexico City where he was living it up with some bullfighters. And no word of a lie, he says that uh, they taught him the art of being a matador. I mean... I can picture it, but please picture Charles Manson as a matador because they are typically a traditional professional matador. They tend to be quite small men because they have to be very like agile because they're dodging a, you know, 2000 pound angry animal. But he says they told him, and again, a direct quote from Charlie himself. You good gringo. You got all the moves, but you'll never be a matador. You know, tall enough. Oh my god, so he's not even tall enough to be a matador. Nope. Even though they're typically men of shorter stature. (laughs) No, you're too small. Uh, Now, he admits that during this time he had a lot of money, so he won many of them over by always being the one who bought drinks. But when his cash began to run out, so did their patience for him. Eventually, they stopped inviting him out. He says that he began running with a rougher crowd. One day, he decided he wanted to buy some mushrooms. But he was told by the locals that the only people with access to them was the Yaki tribe, a group known for their hate of Americans. When he arrived to the area the Yaki called home, they immediately were like, are you lost or something? He told them that he wanted to meet them, become their friend, and smoke with them. When they asked him why the hell they'd want to spend any time with him, he tried to explain that he had money and wanted some mushrooms. (laughs) So prior to this, he had stolen a 357. When he met with the Yaki people, he still had that gun with him. In his mind, he thought that he could try to trade the gun for the mushrooms. So he took the gun out to show it to them and said, this buy mushrooms. Their response was to very quickly back off and offer to just give him the mushrooms. His intention was not to threaten them, so he was surprised at their reaction. He gave the gun to the man who said that he could have them. The man proceeded by sticking the gun in Charles's stomach and pulling the trigger. Luckily, it wasn't loaded, so they all just laughed together. I bet for a second there, Charlie really pooped his pants. I'm sure he did. But they ended up all just doing mushrooms together, so I guess it worked out in the end. (laughs) Once again, this is according to Manson himself, so take it how you will. But honestly, this is fucking hilarious if it actually happened. Two weeks later... He was being picked up by the Federales, and he was being shipped back off to L.A. When he arrived, he expected either one of the girls or one of his pimp pals to pay him the, to help pay him the $10,000 bond so that he could stay out of jail at least a little while longer. He was shocked to see that not one of them 
was willing to even give him the time of day. So he ended up incarcerated yet again. And just like the many times before, no one came to visit. The visits from Candy became less and less frequent. Some point prior to this, the two did conceive a child together, a little boy who would be named Charles Luther Manson. Candy took their son and Charles never saw him again. Man, there was really a pattern developing really? here. That's why it's funny because when I was reading this, I was like, Am I just reading the same story yeah, I was again? Like, is this the same woman or is this just like, is this really happening again? I believe that it's happening again. And oh, yeah. It's, it's also cursed to me that he names his second child with a woman that leaves him. Mm -hmm. Also Charles Manson. Yeah. Stop naming your kids after yourself. Yeah. It's not working for them. It's not a good idea. Little is known about Charles Luther Manson. Candy wanted nothing to do with the father of her child, and it seems she did her best to shield him from the reality of his lineage. Charles tried to appeal his sentence, but was ultimately denied. He was sentenced to serve at McNeil Island in 1961. This is a prison only accessible by boat, and he said that returning there felt like he was going home. And to him, it really was home. He quickly fell into the routine of prison life. He says that he was treated fairly well by the other men, now that he had his own set of stories to tell, things went relatively well for about a year. Then things changed. He says he isn't sure exactly why this happened, but he began to feel different upon the release of some of his closest friends. He says he didn't miss the fun times he had in LA, but his mind went back to those days with Rosalie where he worked and came home to a wife that loved him. Once again, he felt that creeping feeling of maybe, just maybe wanting to be better. The difference between McNeil and other places that Charles had spent his time was that McNeil offered a series of programs for men to get an education or learn a trade skill. The problem was that Charles had never taken his education seriously, which left him with major difficulties when it came to reading and writing. He was evaluated and told that if he wanted to further his education, he would have to start at around the fourth grade level while most of the others around him were studying university-type courses. Proud man that he was, he just could not bring himself to do this. However, he knew that he had to do something, so he began reading on a regular basis in an effort to improve himself however he could. Charles studied various religions. His intention was not to follow their practices, but in hopes of understanding why people did what they did. Fun fact, it was during this time that he and a cellmate of his explored Scientology. For a little while, he actually listed it as his religion of choice. Interesting. In regards to career training, however, he explored various trades but didn't really seem to find something he liked. Instead, he settled on pursuing an old passion of his, music. He said that once he got into music again, everything fell into place for him. He even got assigned to work at the auditorium, which was near the music room. Charles tells a story of his mom visiting him where he asked her to buy him a decent used guitar. Kathleen explained to him that she just didn't have the money. A few weeks later, she showed up with a little girl who she explained was a child she had adopted. This irked Charlie, but he was completely outraged when he found out the adoption had cost her around $2,000. He basically said, fuck you and fuck your new kid and told her he never wanted to see her again. Quite frankly, I can't blame him for his feelings around this time because the amount of times that he was dumped off by his mom. Oh yeah. Only for her to go out and pay money to adopt a new child when she herself had sold him for a pitcher of beer at one point. Yeah, and he says it in the book. He's like, she paid $2,000 to adopt this kid when she told me she couldn't even afford groceries and wouldn't buy me a guitar for $100. Hmm. Now, again, we take this with a whole handful of salt. Because oh, this yeah. Is Charlie's story. But part of me wonders if Kathleen, you know, got wind of how he was still doing and how he was still in and out of fucking prison and maybe felt kind of guilty about the child that she had fucked up, basically. So she was like, I'm going to go adopt a new one and maybe see if we can do right by them. I could see that, you know, but obviously that's no help to Charles. For a few days, he pouted and stopped playing music, but that didn't last. And before long, he was practicing harder than ever. 
It was around this time that Charlie would meet and befriend Alvin Karpis, who is also known as Creepy Alvin Karpis of the infamous Ma Barker gang. These guys are definitely on our list. Alvin was a fascinating character, and that's a story I can't wait to share. It is a wild story. (laughs) By this point in his life, Old Creepy, as he was often called, had about 30 years of jail time under his belt. He was well-respected by everyone around him, especially Charles, who basically idolized the guy. Alvin took a liking to young Charles, and the two would often play guitar together and spend hours talking. Alvin talked a lot about his distrust in the system, as well as all of the things the CIA was up to in other countries. He was a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He also helped Charlie realize that in the grand scheme of things, he knew absolutely nothing about life in the real world. This humbled him, and he was willing to learn a bit more about who he really was. It was around this time that Charles began writing his own music, and it was also around this time that Candy officially filed for divorce. Oh, so two divorces under his belt in how many years in prison? Yep. In June of 1966, Charles was transferred back to Terminal Island. He was staying out of trouble, and his sentence was nearing an end. He was happy about this for a multitude of reasons, but one of them was that, in his mind, this is a step up for his music career. Due to how close it was to Hollywood, a lot of famous musicians would perform there to test out new music. Oftentimes, they'd encourage the inmates to participate, and Charles loved being on stage. He spent the final year of his sentence relatively happy. Much of his time was spent writing music and performing. He says that at this time he had everything and had the best world he had ever known. The only thing missing was a girl to love. When he was due to be released the following year, he actually asked if he could just stay in jail. I've heard that many, many people upon release do not do well in the real world. No, and he's been incarcerated for like his entire life at this point. He's spent more time incarcerated than he has as a free man, really. Oh, by far. He talks about this numerous times, both in his book and again in a 1981 interview he did with Tom Snyder. And like I said, in this sense, who could really blame him because he's comfortable, it's home to him. The life that Charles had in prison at that time was really a dream compared to the harsh reality of the real world. He had spent the seven years eagerly awaiting this moment. Now that it had come, he had no clue what to do with himself. He was released with 30 bucks and was taken to board the ferry back to the mainland. Eventually, he called up a former inmate he had befriended who offered him a job. His parole officer allowed him to relocate to Northern California. Something to keep in mind here was just how much society would have changed while he was incarcerated. It was now 1967 and everything was different. He was directed to a nightclub that was hiring performers. He auditioned and was told that he was good and had a decent voice, However, he was 10 years behind the times. Because can you imagine if you went into prison when, say, like, the Nintendo 64 was a thing, and then you left 20 years later, and it's like, what the fuck is a PlayStation? Seriously. (laughs) And it's funny, because you can really hear that in the way that he talks. Yes, because he, he does come off as almost out of time. He really does. And he stays that way, too. Even towards his later years, when you Mm -hmm. hear him talk, he is not of our time. No, definitely not. He met a 15-year-old kid during this time who taught him about all the things that were now cool. And this kid, he's basically teenage Charles. Oh, so he's probably seeing a lot of himself in this kid. Oh, definitely. He had spent the majority of his young life in institutions, and he was out on his own. He stole and sold drugs to get by. And it's interesting, because when you hear about this, you think maybe Charles would have taken on a father role to this kid. But essentially, it was the other way around. He says in the book that the kid became his professor. This little hoodlum introduced Charles to the Haight-Ashbury district, which was made popular by the hippies of the time. It was here that Charles went on his first acid trip. He was at a Grateful Dead concert. I feel like a lot of people had their first acid trips at a Grateful Dead concert. I feel like they would have, yep. (laughs) So in the book, he says that he would have been blown away by all this, even if he wasn't on drugs. There were flashing lights, and everyone was dressed in a way he had never seen before. He danced, and he danced, and then he passed out. He woke up the next morning in a room full of people. The 15-year-old had taken care of him. The group welcomed him, and he fell in love with their free way of life. 
He spent his time floating around from couch to couch, saying he'd catch up on baths whenever he was invited to stay at someone's apartment. Stinky. He also says that the occult was practiced openly and was socially acceptable. However, he never partook in rituals or what he called mind trips. One day, Charles had hitchhiked to the University of California. He had done this a few times before to meet new people and play guitar with them. This time, though, he would meet someone whose life he would change forever. According to him, he was sitting and strumming his guitar when a dog ran up to him. The dog began sniffing his foot. Poor dog, honestly. I don't want to think about Charles Manson's no, feet. absolutely not. He started to move his foot back as if he was going to kick the dog when a voice from afar yelled, Don't hurt my dog! He told her to get the ugly dog away from him or he would kick him. And this is how he described her. The girl was a slim, red-headed, straight-laced type. She wasn't pretty, but standing there in defiance of someone who might hurt her animal, she had qualities. Man, if you threatened to kick my dog, I would just kick the shit out of you. I'd beat the five shit. Five foot yeah. five, Charles Manson. You kick my dog, I'll kick your face. <laughs> he, and he also, he has this thing that I've noticed where every time he talks about a girl in the book, he points out that she wasn't that pretty. Okay, Manson. Because, like, you're the yeah. be-all, end-all judge of that. Have you looked in the mirror lately, sir? Sir, you died with a swastika carved in your forehead. <laughs> Let's not be judging other people's appearances, please. So, this young lady introduced herself as Mary Brunner. She worked at the university as a librarian. I thought that said she worked at the university as a lesbian. And I was like, I didn't know they had jobs for that. <laughs> The two quickly began to joke around, and she started to tease him for his poor grammar. At one point, she told him, You should stick to singing. When you talk, you sound like an ex-felon. Charles explained to her that he had just been released from prison, and somehow he charmed her into letting him spend the night at her apartment. When he got there, he immediately tried to sleep with her and was rejected. The two did become fast friends, and soon enough, Charlie was moving in. And I want to just point this out. I'll give him one thing. Okay. The little motherfucker was charming. I He must have had something because, quite frankly, if I was in the same situation here as her, my dog went up to him. He threatened to kick my dog. I said, don't kick my dog. I'll kick you. And then suddenly he's in my apartment. Yeah. The man must have rizzed her up somehow. Seriously, apparently they just, they had this really fun chat. They were laughing. She loved it. And then they're living together. Wild. We do want to point out that she didn't invite him to live with her. He just kind of started bringing more and more things until eventually when she's like, okay, fine, you're already here. A few days later, he was gallivanting about Haight-Ashbury when he saw a young girl walking up the street by herself looking rather lost. From afar, he saw a large man approach her. He began putting his hands on her and harassing her. Charles noticed that she looked absolutely terrified, so he ran up to her and pretended she was his sister that he was supposed to be meeting. The man backed off and left. He took her out for a meal, and she told him she had just run away from home. She told him her name was Darlene, and she was only 16 years old, although she looked much younger. Darlene had no money and nowhere to go. Charles told her that this was no place for her and tried to persuade her to return to her parents, but she didn't listen. Without knowing how Mary would react, he brought the young girl home to stay with them. To his surprise, she wasn't upset. She was just incredibly worried for the 16-year-old runaway. In a normal world where this isn't Charles fucking Manson, this is a very honorable and wholesome thing to do. Like, yeah. hey honey, I was out on the street. I saw this young girl getting harassed by some big, ugly motherfucker. She's going to stay with us for a bit. Yeah. If Cody did that, I'd be like, absolutely. Let's pump up the air mattress. Yeah. Here's, you know, shower, look after yourself. Do you need anything? Do you need to call anyone? Do you need me to drive you anywhere? Yeah. Awesome. I love this. Let's look out for one another. But it's Charles Manson. And the thing with this and the thing with so many of the stories he tells is like, they start good, they start fine, and you're like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And, you know, and I'm then it just goes to shit. I'm starting to see how he raises these people. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's this charm, and it's, it's fucked up. It's so fucked up. This wouldn't be the first girl that he would bring home to marry. According to Manson and other sources, at one point, they had 18 girls living with them in the small apartment. 
In the book, he really prides himself for not trying to sleep with Mary or Darlene. After all, he was recently released for prison and was known to be a guy who really liked the company of women, or at least the thought of it. However, that didn't last long, and dear listeners, it wasn't Mary that he set his sights on. It was Darlene. This whole situation is honestly repulsive, and it really brings this entire story back to earth and reminds us that we aren't talking about some fun-loving musical scamp. We're talking about Charles Manson, a pretty shitty guy, and we're going to tell the story in his own words from the book, and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a warning. Like, this, it's nasty. It's going to make your skin call. And honestly, I'm sad that I even have to read it out loud. Yeah. A couple of days later, however, Darlene was hanging around the apartment in a pair of skimpy shorts and a very revealing halter, he said. We'll remind you again, this is a 16-year-old girl who he admitted paragraphs prior to this didn't even look 13. He goes on to say, Looking at her, I noticed stretch marks on her stomach. I pointed and said, What are these? Darlene glanced at the marks and replied, oh, that's from when I had my baby. When I was 14, a Mexican gardener raped me. I responded, well, hell, girl, you're legal then. Why haven't we been sleeping together? Oh, my God. Gee, Charlie, I've been waiting for you to say something. I thought you didn't want me, she said. Are you for real? I've been locked up for a lifetime dreaming of a young, tender thing like you. If you want to pause the episode for a moment so you can go puke, we don't blame you. No, not at all. That is so fucking repulsive. When Mary got home, Charles told her about what had happened between him and Darlene. She immediately told him she felt like he was taking advantage of her. He quipped back that because the girl wasn't a virgin, it wasn't a big deal. I know this was a different time. I understand that. But, Mm -hmm. all that aside... Mm -hmm. Even if you take age out of it, which like, yeah, she has just told you I had a baby when I was very young because someone sexually assaulted me. Yeah. And his immediate response was to be like, why don't we sleep together? Yeah. Hello. And that's the thing. Like I said, this gets brought back to earth very Very quickly. Like, cause you see it. He has these moments where you're like, okay, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. And I can't even figure out if it's there's some little voice inside of him that's genuinely trying to be good and is like you need to help this person that's the good thing to do that's the right thing to do and then the evil part is like nah yeah or if he knows that in order to charm someone in order to get someone to trust him you have to act like you care and i think it is the second one there because in the book he talks about how the other inmates, when they were teaching him about how to get women to agree to sell their bodies for him, mm-hmm. he, they would tell him, you need to make them fall in love with you. You need to make them feel safe around okay. you. And yeah. then they'll do anything you want. And I think, like, that's exactly what he's doing here. And it's working. It's working. <sighs> so Darlene overheard this conversation between Charles and Mary and told Mary that the sex was consensual. He admits that as time went on, he didn't fall in love with her, but he enjoyed her presence both emotionally and physically. However, one day he came home and heard Darlene having sex with someone else. And let's just say it certainly sounded like she was having a better time with this person than she ever did with him. Woof. When Darlene exited the room, she was shocked to see Charles standing there. She apologized profusely, to which he said, whatever, it's not like you're mine anyway. And they moved on, but not before Darlene swore to never sleep with anyone else again. Charles attempted to play it cool. He definitely did. But in the book, he shares some lyrics that he wrote after all that. And uh, Charlotte is going to be the lucky one who gets to read them to you fine folks. Okay, here we go. I am a man torn, traveling a path well worn. A man with a struggling mind, searching for love and happiness combined. On the campus of a university, I found a girl to love and trust, but to her sex was wrong and less a wife. Not being the marrying kind, I searched on. The streets of San Francisco, I found a wayward waif without a home of her own, saddened by life. This wayward waif without love shared my must for lust. And now in my heart are two girls, one for love and one for lust. I am a man torn, wanting the girl I love to ease my struggling mind and be my love, sharing my lust with some of her own. 
Or must I travel on, seeking another who will be both in one? Or should I stay and forever be a man torn? Really shocking that the uh, music career didn't take off. Yeah, I don't know that I got quite the cadence of that, right? Because there but, isn't. Um, yeah, I can't say it's the best even poetry I've ever No, had, it's really so. not. The, the rhyming scheme is really off. I, I read that a few times. Every time I'm like typing it, I'm like, am I typing this wrong? No, I think it's just really poorly written. <laughs> Probably. He shared these lyrics with Mary, and some way, somehow, this was when she changed her mind about him. Because up until now, Charles had stuck to his word about not making a move, but this song was his way of doing it, and it worked. A few days later, she approached him and told him she changed her mind and wanted to sleep with him. And listen, this part of the book gets straight up pornographic. Like, it, he goes on for like four or five pages about the first time they slept together. I'm sure she didn't really think about it ever again, except for the fact that, oh, gross, I slept with Charles Manson. She became one of the Manson girls, so uh, <sighs> it worked. And the thing is, like, I don't want to think too much about it. No. I really don't. I don't want to think about what he was like in bed. Ew. All that to say, they did spend the night together. She told him that she loved him, and he says that the next morning she was a changed woman. She made him breakfast and catered to his every need. This made Darlene incredibly jealous. I'm feeling a Rock Terrio kind of vibe happening now. Right? It, it's a cult leader thing, I swear. It has to be. And he loved all of this. The next day after Mary left for work, Darlene told Charles that she also loved him and that she regretted ever being with somebody else. Somehow, he convinced the two that they would share him from now on. Darlene agreed quickly, but Mary was hesitant at first. Eventually, though, she did agree, and for a while, he slept with Mary at night and Darlene during the day. <laughs> the three would go out together, and he'd often have them asking which one of them was better in bed. They were constantly jealous of each other, but Charles was in heaven. There has to be some embellishment on his part here. So much embellishment. I don't believe it. I really, I don't believe it for a second. Like, the thing I remember is Mary would be devoted to him yes. forever. Yeah. But... I just don't believe that they were just like sitting around fawning over him. Yeah. And being like, oh, Charles, we love you so much. Yeah. Like, no. I mean, I just, he can't have, again, I'm going to say, he can't have been that good He can't have been. No. <laughs> <sighs> when things were over, it may surprise you to know that it wasn't Mary who wanted out, it was Darlene. She told him that she wanted to go home, and he gave her the bus money, took her to the depot where they said their goodbyes. He would not hear from Darlene until after his conviction. She ended up getting married to someone else, having children, and living her own life. Good for her. I'm happy for her. At least she was able to move on in some way. Yeah. She didn't end up like the rest of the uh, Manson ladies, as we will get into. Some time passed before Charles would meet another lady who really caught his eye. This time, he was hitchhiking south when a man picked him up. The two chatted about the Bible, and eventually he realized the man probably wanted to save his soul when he introduced himself as Reverend Dean Morehouse. He invited him for dinner, and Charles, being hungry, accepted. He was thrilled to see that the Reverend had a beautiful young daughter named Ruth Ann. Before long, he was visiting on a regular basis. They chat about religion and enjoy each other's company. He doesn't go on too much about Ruth Ann. And I just hope Grill was safe. I mean, uh, he just, like, he corrupts everything he touches. And I just think about her. She was very young. She was around Darlene's age. And uh, just his type. Oh, God. I hate it so much. One day while Charles was in town, he saw a Volkswagen van and he fell in love. He didn't have the money to buy it, but he approached the man who agreed that he would take the reverend's piano in exchange for the van as long as they delivered it. They did, and soon enough, Charles had what he would call his whorehouse on wheels, one that Mary was more than happy to fix up. Can you imagine coming home and you're like, um, this is just me, or was there not a piano here before? <laughs> Meanwhile, the shag and wagon is parked out front. Right, exactly. And the thing is, he like would go over to the reverend's house, and he'd play the piano for him, and he'd sing, and they'd have a good time. And then one day, he's like, hey, I want this van. Can I take your piano? And the reverend was like, sure. This makes no sense. The van also meant that now Charles had a place to sleep every night. This allowed him to have a safe place to go, as well as a form of transportation. And let's just say, the ladies seemed to love it. 
they drive around and meet lots of different hitchhikers. And these were often younger people who were searching for meaning in their life or at least adventure. Charles was happy to help provide the latter. To them, he had all the answers. He was older now, 33 at this point, and compared to their young lives, he had really lived. In the book, he talks about various girls that they met and how he'd impressed them by playing music and saying he was a recording artist. Well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves We here, are. Right? They'd often get stoned together. Of course, the girls would provide the drugs. And the interactions would more often than not end in sex because Charles would often preach to them that love was meant to be shared. Because after all, we're in California and it's the summer of love. After traveling a bit, they headed back to LA where Charles had planned to meet with a studio contact. When they arrived, the guy was out of town, so Charles moved on. He attempted on numerous occasions to seek out his old friends from the 60s, but was usually unsuccessful. And I want to take it a second to point out another piece of information that gets confusing. There's a lot of them because, again, he's not the most honest fella. Mm -hmm. There are two different accounts of this. In most versions of the story, they traveled in an old school bus that they had removed the seats from. They filled it with blankets and pillows and they used it to travel the country. The van version is only from Manson in his own words, but everyone else seems to agree that it was a bus. Interesting. Because either way, whether you got a hippie van or a hippie bus... I wouldn't put one of them over the other in the sense that, like, it doesn't make for a better story. No. So why the confusion there? I honestly, I wonder that too. And I'm like, I wonder if he just didn't remember. Well, like we just said, there were a lot of drugs happening. Yes. There were a lot of people coming and going, Mm -hmm. a lot of people staying on each other's couches. I bet he didn't remember. He may not have. He was like, yeah, there was a bus or a van or something. (laughs) Or house on wheels. That is just... The picture itself. Mm -hmm. So one night he parks the van bus and he went for a walk. He then saw a young redhead with a face full of freckles sitting on a bench. He describes her as shapely and about 18. When he got closer, he noticed that she appeared to be sad or angry. And so he struck up her conversation. We really want to share this next bit from the book because again, it's honestly hilarious. He says, in a book I once read part of, (laughs) Like, oh, you didn't read the whole thing. Yeah, he's like, I didn't read the whole thing, but I read a part of it. That's like me saying, yeah, um, like, oh, yeah, I I read an article. Meanwhile, I watched a two-minute TikTok video. Right? (laughs) I've researched this. The author said he approached this particular girl and used the words, I am the god of fuck, and lured her into his van. I'd like to say that author is a fucking liar, as are a lot of other writers. But back to the girl. (laughs) (laughs) I am the god of fuck. Charlie, I'm a laughing in your face. I'd be like, get fucking get away from me, right? Pervert. And you know, I, I wonder if he, I'm not saying it worked, but I wonder if he ever tried that line out. I'm sure he of had course, to have, right? He had to have. Instead of that killer of a line, he actually sat down and said, you look like you have problems. Is there anything I can do to help? And when you think about it, again, I hate to talk about his height a lot. I'm not like height shaming. No, I'm absolutely not. But he's a little dude. Mm -hmm. And he probably seemed fairly, like, innocent at this point to her. And he just sits down. He's like, how can I help? Again, a different time, and I'm a different person. I'm also in my 30s, so I have a little more experience under my belt. Um, If I was crying on a park bench, and a little man came and sat next to me and was like, you having a hard time, sweetie? I'd be like, stop fucking talking to me. (laughs) That's because you're smart. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I don't like people so yeah, to me I'd be, exactly. like, I'd be like brother <laughs> yeah I'm having a hard time because you're fucking bothering me yeah can you not leave me just to like sob and be angry and right peace? she told him that it was nothing she couldn't handle and he said okay uh, it just seemed like you could use a friend so he gets up and he begins to walk away just as he was leaving she asked him where he was going and if she could come She introduced herself as Lynette Fromm and said sometimes people called her Squeaky. I would say Squeaky is now considered one of the best known of all the Manson girls. Yes. Oh, sweetie, if you'd have just let him walk away. Squeaky, 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 my girl. Walk away. So kind of a funny sidebar, I wanted to share this, but I was recently chatting with this lady that's in her 80s and um, the podcast came up and the Manson family Mm -hmm. came up. And I asked her what she remembered about this time because I was curious about how much of the news came to Canada. Oh, yeah. And she told me, she said, in her old age, because she's quite old, 
She said she didn't remember much, but she did remember how her husband would often tell their daughter that she would end up like that squeaky from girl to scare her whenever she was in trouble. And this was in small town Alberta. I mean, that's, I mean, it's like saying like, you know, don't pull faces like that because if the wind changes, you yeah, know, your face will stay like that. It's like, don't be a bad girl because of the way you live up like squeaky from. I loved it. Honestly, I thought that was hilarious. Especially, yeah, small town Alberta. Right? He talks about they walked and talked for quite a while. And Charles points out that there was no, and these are his words, immediate sex trip. But when they did have sex, it was because they both wanted to. I should fucking hope so. Yeah, right? That's not a brag, my friend. No. No. Squeaky shared that she was trying to escape the clutches of her domineering father, which instantly reminded him of Kathleen and everything she had gone through as a child. The day the two of them met, she had had a huge fight with her dad and had attempted to run away from home and stay with her boyfriend. However, when she arrived at his house, he wasn't home. Frustrated and disappointed, she went for a walk that would ultimately change the entire course of her life. Can you imagine? It's, it, it's always mind-blowing, even just the entirety of human history, how one teeny tiny decision yeah. changes everything. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but when Squeaky From followed him away, yeah. Sharon Tate died that day. Absolutely. And all the other victims. Yeah. That decision changed everything. And obviously Squeaky didn't know where this was all going. No. Because we're not psychics here. But like those little things, or like I keep bringing up, the fact that his mom tried to sell him for a pitcher of beer. And all these times there were, you see the road split. Yeah. And he goes down the wrong road or someone else goes down the wrong road. Yes. And that is where we'll pick up next week with the introduction of Spawn Ranch and even more of the Manson Girls. And if it does seem like this episode was relatively tame, um, that's because compared to what we'll be talking about next week, it pretty much was. Yeah, because the summer of love is going to get hateful real fast. That is honestly the perfect way to put it. Okay, so before we end the episode, we do have a few things we just wanted to chat about about real briefly first and foremost you may have noticed some changes on our social media yes so we are going to be a lot more active from here on out we're going to be posting video clips from all of our episodes on tiktok youtube facebook instagram so if you do see our content while you're out and about on the internet please like and comment it helps us immensely yeah and if you really love us give us a share yeah you know Across all the different social media platforms, there's various ways that you can interact, you know, liking, sharing, reposting, yeah. commenting, all of that good stuff. And honestly, we like hearing your guys' opinions on these cases. It's been so much fun to actually see a lot more people commenting. Mm -hmm. We keep bringing it up because it keeps coming back up. But the whole Sprat thing... It has evolved. This is now a saga. Okay, so even my mom actually commented on one of our posts yes. where you asked about sprats. And although my dad uses sprats for potatoes, or tatties as he calls them, tatties. my mom said, na na na, you gotta talk to mama, a sprat is a little sardine. And we had another viewer send us a picture of uh, sprats that he bought in Edmonton. I have been looking for sprats everywhere, I have. But he found them in Edmonton at Fresh Co. In and what form? They are like, they're canned. Oh, like pickled or like preserved. Then. Yeah, they're just like little fish in a jar and you just you eat them. I love seafood. I don't know that I'd be brave enough. Listen, I have already decided for us. <laughs> oh, no. That when and if. No, I'm going to say when. I find them. Okay, if you find them, I will try one. For Patreon. For Patreon. Do it for the Patreon. Do it, do it for the plot. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, hey, if my parents have tried them, and likely my grandparents and everyone too, I guess i got to give it a try. Well, the one thing everyone is saying about Sprats is they're delicious. I'll be the judge of that when we find them. I'll, I'm fine as long as they don't have heads. I agree. I've, I've had, um, now this is from years and years and years ago, uh, when we still lived in the UK, or maybe one of the first times we went back to visit after we moved to Canada. Uh, we were there in the summer, and 
uh, we were on a little tiny beach in Dorset. So if you're from the south of England, you'll know. Um, and it was this really cool event where the big fish pushed all the little fish up onto the beach and people were going with like the little buckets for um, sandcastles and like filling the buckets with these little tiny, I think white bait fish. Mm -hmm. And you literally, you fry the whole thing. Like you just drop them all into a deep fryer or whatever and you eat the whole thing. And I remember being immensely freaked out by the fact that they still had eyeballs. It, it is definitely very scary. I'm going to tell you something that you're really going to like. Um, I believe sprats are a form of white fish or white bait fish. Okay, well then I've had white bait, like deep fried white bait. Well, then you may have had sprats. Who can really say? Well, you know what? You're going to have them again, my friend. I mean, so. I've never had pickled ones or preserved ones or ever, so it's going to be a whole new experience. Maybe so. I'll like do a little sprat platter for you. A splatter. A splatter. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, all that to say, um, we have a lot of content going out all over the place, so keep an eye out for it. Interact with it. Um, this will be our third video episode on Patreon, because we did Charlie Manson number one. Yep. Then we did extra credit, mm -hmm. which was a little late. I do apologize for that, but time constraints are a thing, and I do have a day job, but I'm trying my best. You got to sign up for that Patreon so, we, so, so we don't have that day I job. I guess so. Yeah. Oh, guys. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, from now on, all of our episodes will have, hopefully, barring any technical difficulties, uh, they will have a matching video that goes up on Patreon. And Dina has been doing a wonderful job at sharing little clips all over the place. So that's super awesome. If you want to see us talk about grim things in the flesh, please consider checking us out over there. On top of that, we've got a lot of other awesome content too. We always do early episode reveals. So if you want to know what we're covering ahead of time, sometimes we kind of sneak peeky it or kind of hint to it, but like Dina will let you know a couple of days ahead of time usually. We've got some blooper reels on there from all the times we fucked up. And a lot. There's a lot. Oh yes, we have a Discord where people hang out too. And I'd, I'd like to start doing more with the Discord. I just need to figure out what that is. And also I need the time. We're working on it. We're working, you know, we're growing. We're growing. We just celebrated our second birthday two days ago. And we, I feel like in the two years we have done a lot. I really do. Like, I feel like we've grown a lot and mm -hmm. we're just growing further. We're still learning. And the Patreon is just another way for us to have fun. But we've wanted to do video content since like day one. So it's a huge deal. You're going to enjoy, hopefully, seeing our studio grow, seeing all the new additions. Yeah, here, like, let's, let's, I'm just going to angle y'all up a little bit. Oh, look at that. Look at him. Okay, so, story. Uh, his name's Ernie. Ernie. <laughs> and uh, Steve's grandpa, also named Ernie, who he named him after. Um, he, uh, he shot and killed and this was all done legally. It was all yes, tagged. So Steve did tell me he, it was all stress that. Yeah. He fed the family. He fed the family for like over a year, but he brought this in today and I just like, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, Dina's cat is not a fan. No. <laughs> and honestly, like he's the perfect addition. I want to give him some sunglasses. I'm not going to lie. I think our next goal is to get someone matching on this side. Oh, do we already have plans? I oh, check. Yeah, there's. He's got a buddy. <gasps> I know. Okay, I can't wait. Well, so at some point in the near future, hopefully, Ernie will have a friend. Seriously, like I mean, yeah, the the studio's growing. It's it's our little humble space, but we're really excited. And Patreon helps us in a huge way. And all the money goes towards growing this little dream of ours. And Right now, our big goal is to invest in some new mics. Yes. So that's kind of the number one thing that we're focusing on right now. That would be really awesome just to kind of like boost the sound because we went from basically recording in really tight little literal blanket ports. Literal blanket ports. Yeah. Like where it's like, yeah, there's a blanket, there's yeah. blankets. And now obviously we're in a room with a much higher ceiling. So if you have noticed the audio quality change, that is why I'm working on it. I'm trying to learn more and more about sound quality. And you're doing great. I'm trying. And you know what? Like the room I feel at this point, it's soundproofed enough. We just need, we're using my Blue Yeti from when I was streaming. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to eventually have, you know, a mic for each of us. And uh, 
just be the girl stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We got goals. And like Dina said, everything that we have coming into Patreon, we put straight back into the podcast. And so any little improvements you guys see, it's because of you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? You can cut this out or you can leave it for the patrons. Sure. But I just want, I want to show you something. Remember that time I fell outside of your house? Like, Ooh, was that like two, three months yes, ago? Yes, yes, yes. This bruise is a scar from that. Oh my God. It hasn't gone away. That is brutal. Right? It won't go away. It won't heal. Maybe you need some more iron in your diet. I think I do. <laughs> I bruise like a peach. Oh. All right, so... You can find us at patreon.com slash the grim curriculum. Go check it out. Absolutely. And speaking of, it's now that time of the episode now that we've blabbed on and, and I don't know, told you guys about all the news and all the things. Yeah. We, of course, shout out everyone at the top tier on our Patreon, which is our wonderful, glorious grim VIPs. So a huge, huge thank you to Lisa. Atlantean Jedi, who recently celebrated a birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Bob, Brian, Hillary. Who also celebrated her birthday Oh my today. god, Hillary. Happy birthday, Hillary. Judy, Kevinist Musicus, and Mayhem Mudkip. You guys are, you're so cool. You're fabulous. And we love you. For those of you that have been listening for a while, you've heard these names come up episode after episode. These new people are dedicated. Yeah. And oh my god, we love you. And wouldn't it be cool to hear your own name? on that list absolutely Ooh, i'm gonna start saying my own name at the end of the list my mom just joined our patreon <gasps> oh that's so sweet and actually you know what i was looking through all the fabulous people that are on patreon and uh, i'm pretty sure i've got a couple of relatives that popped up recently too so i love that hello Thanks, guys hello. hi i don't think we have anything else to talk about today do we yeah. i think we've yacked on for long enough we have i'm really excited for part three question mark i don't uh, it's gonna be rough it's gonna be really rough i mean we all know the story and uh, we're gonna dive deep into it and yeah i'm excited to bring it to you guys yeah Maybe you'll learn a little something about the case you didn't already know before we'll go through it together we absolutely will thank you all so much for listening this has been the, the grim, grim curriculum. curriculum and i need to find a fact for you let me think do you guys know that statistically speaking Half of all bank robberies take place on a Friday. Really? So if you've got any bank robberies tomorrow, keep your eyes peeled. Oh my goodness. Bye. Bye. <laughs>